Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. What you'll hear are adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And these are your stories. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. One more thing. You just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. Another five-minute mystery. This five minute mystery is being brought to you by Major League Baseball. Yep, it's that time of year again, and all I have to say is Go Cubs Go! Ron, has anyone ever told you that you have lost your grip on reality? BG tells me that every week. He has a point. Dr. Greenwood speaking. Oh, Dr. Greenwood. Dr. Greenwood, this is Mrs. Barnes. Yes? Something horrible has happened. My husband... What's happened to him? He seemed well this morning. The medicine you left. He's killed himself with it. Oh, uh, Dr. Greenwood. Where's your mistress? Well, Mrs. Barnes is upstairs in her bedroom. She's taken this very badly, doctor. Isn't there anyone with her? No. Mrs. Barnes only phoned you and Mr. Graham. Graham? Speedy Graham. He's the manager of the Blue Sox, the baseball team. Mr. Barnes pitched for them. Oh, where is his body? Well, right in this next room, sir. Won't you step this way? Has anyone been in here since since Mr. Barnes died? Well, no, sir. That is... uh... Sorry, Dr. Greenwood, that I couldn't be here to greet you. I understand completely, Miss Barnes. I'm still hardly able to think clearly. Please, try to tell me what happened. Well, after you left this morning, Mr. Barnes became very difficult. You mean about the injections I told you to give him? Yes. He thought that I wouldn't know how to handle the hypodermic. He begged me to send for you. And then? And what happened? Well, I came in about two this afternoon. Right into this room, I saw him putting the hypodermic needle into his own arm. His face was contorted with pain. Yes? I cried out to him. He slumped to the ground, pale as a ghost. And a few minutes later, he was dead. Hmm. Look, you can still see the mark of the needle there on his left arm. Yes, so you can. So you can. Oh, answer that, please, Gertrude. It's probably speedy. Said he'd be over as soon as he could make it. You say, Mrs. Barnes, that your husband became very pale? Yes. And, oh, please, Dr. Greenwood, don't make me describe it to you again. It was too horrible. Mrs. Barnes, I don't know what to say. It's been a great shock. Oh, thank you, Speedy. I know how you feel. Mr. Graham, do you know of any reason why Mr. Barnes would have wanted to take his own life? Why, no, sir, I can't think of any. Always seemed happy to me. Excepting for this last spell, always had good health, made good money. Why, he was the best southpaw in the business. I see. Mrs. Barnes, you've had a hard few hours. Why don't you rest while I take care of the details? Mr. Graham, I don't think I'd wasted any sympathy with Mrs. Barnes. I'm going to have her arrested on the charge of murdering her husband. Why does Dr. Greenwood accuse Mrs. Barnes of murdering her husband? In a moment, the doctor will tell you himself, but first... Yes, why in the world would the doctor accuse that nice Mrs. Barnes of murder? Because she did it. There was no motive. Since when do these FMMs provide motive? Good point. She did have opportunity and there was the baseball reference. Baseball? He was a left-handed pitcher. Oh, that just ties it up all in a bow. Albert Einstein once said, only two things are infinite. The universe and human stupidity. And I'm not sure about the universe. And now, let's see if your observation is as keen as Dr. Greenwood. Well, to tell you the truth, I was puzzled in the beginning. I couldn't understand how he could have killed himself with a harmless preparation that I'd prescribed. But how did you connect Mrs. Barnes to the murder? Her story and the telltale needle mark on his left arm. You see, Barnes was a southpaw, a left-handed pitcher. If he had really given himself a needle, the mark would have been on the right arm. 
I see what you did there with the left-handed pitcher thing. I'll bet you're proud of yourself. It was surprisingly obvious. Not obvious at all. Some southpaw pitchers are ambidextrous, you know. Never assume the obvious is true. Anyone with half a mind could see it. Why can't you? BG, sometimes it's hard to find half a mind when you need one. But yet, somehow, you do it every day. Amazing. It's that you say? Hello, and welcome to the podcast. On the show today, we have volcanoes. Wow, Ron, that was explosive. Thank you. Only the best on Ron's Amazing Stories. All of them have them. All of them? Well, okay, you might have to stretch your imagination just a bit. We have two listener stories that at least mention volcanoes. Gustav has an encounter with some strange creatures there, and Roxana dreams about them. Volcanoes? That's right. In our featured story, Tarzan has to save a village from one while proving he's not guilty of murder. Sounds complicated. You have no idea. And we begin the show with an audiobook review that takes place in Yellowstone. Oh, hey. I know that there are volcanoes there. Yes, indeed. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Audible has sponsored the show now since July of 2019. We have reviewed more than 140 audiobooks, and the list keeps growing. Did you know that Audible has over 200,000 books available? And a lot of those are included in the free catalog. Audible is amazing, and it is the perfect companion to Ron's Amazing Stories. If you like this podcast, you're going to love Audible. So what am I listening to? Outland, Quantum Earth, Book One by Dennis E. Taylor, And it's read for us by Ray Porter. When the Yellowstone supervolcano erupts, it's up to six college students and their experimental physics project to prevent the end of civilization. Okay, you had me at supervolcano. I never would have found this book without a recommendation from Audible. And I'm so glad they did. This is a very entertaining adventure about a couple groups of college students. One group has developed a portal to an alternate Earth where humans never evolved. The other group are geologists following the pending eruption of the Yellowstone supervolcano. Here's a clip from early in the book. Erin Savard's hand went to her mouth as she watched the news report. Terror at Yellowstone scrolled across the bottom of the screen. Gasps and excited comments from the other people in the cafeteria echoed her shock. A woman stood in the middle of Fire Hill Road looking wildly around, seemingly making a decision she tried to take a step, and her foot came out of its shoe. Her eyes grew wide and she paused, foot raised in the air and terror plain on her face. She looked back at her shoe, stuck in the asphalt, then turned to look off camera. 
The camera panned to the right to show a man reaching for her and urging her on. She took a step, pulling her other foot out of its shoe and screamed as her bare flesh touched the road's surface. Only her momentum saved her from a face plant and potentially fatal burns. In three steps, she made it to the side of the road and collapsed, moaning into the man's arms. The camera panned to show other victims, rocking in pain or being embraced by friends or family. Then the video pulled back, showing the news anchor with an expression of professional, deep concern. Yikes! Aaron's stomach did a flip-flop as she tried to imagine running on semi-molten asphalt. She turned to look at her two tablemates. I think I'll bring a couple pairs of good boots for the field trip. What happened anyway? Leslie asked. Underground lava flow, Aaron replied. There are tons of lava tubes under Yellowstone. Once in a while, one gets a fresh flow of lava and it heats the ground, or in this case, the road. And this one was hot enough to melt it quickly and without warning. And this is normal? Well, not Normal like afternoon rush hour, but normal like tornadoes, yes. And you're still going? Even with everyone seated, Leslie had to look up at her much taller friend, astonishment plain on her face. Are you insane? Of course I'm going, Aaron replied. It's a geology field trip, not a tourist outing. If I can't handle risks, I might as well switch majors. And anyway, what's the fun in just staring at cold lava? Fun, my God, Aaron! You've got some kind of death wish. Ayanda put down her soda and cocked her head in Leslie's direction. Lit majors, no sense of adventure. Screw you and screw that, Leslie retorted. Friday nights at the High Dive are adventure enough, please and thanks. I hope she wasn't burned too badly, Aaron said after a moment, tilting her head toward the TV. That looked painful. Normal for Yellowstone doesn't make it any less traumatic for people caught in it. Aaron's phone beeped. She looked at it and sighed. And with that, lunch is over. I, purely by coincidence, have a geology lecture. Want to come, Leslie? Leslie rolled her eyes without comment and grabbed her book pile. With a casual wave, she headed off for her own class. She has a point, though, Ayanda said as she and Aaron made for the lecture hall. I've been hearing all kinds of rumors, over and above the news, I mean. Could it be getting perhaps a little dangerous for this trip? We'll probably find out today, but I hope it doesn't get canceled. If I wanted an office job, I'd take up programming like Matt. They entered the lecture hall, making a beeline for their favorite seats. Dead center, third row up, put them right at the instructor's eye level, perfect for getting his attention for Q&A. Have you called Matt about canceling your Friday date yet? You promised you'd come to our next girls' night out. Oh, jeez, no. And I don't want to end up texting him, not after I lectured the poor guy about him changing plans by text. Oh, well. Consistency is for small minds, right? Ayanda opened her mouth to reply just as Professor Collins turned on his lapel microphone, resulting in an amplified pop. The background mutter of multiple conversations was replaced by the sounds of students straightening in their seats as everyone settled in for the lecture. I'm sure you've all seen the news by now, the professor began. A week ago, Geyser Hill opened a new fumarole right under a boardwalk and badly scalded some tourists. Yesterday, one of the local roads heated up while a tour group was walking around and trapped some of them. As scary as these events may be, they are neither unusual nor remarkable. Now, after this bit, Yellowstone really does blow up. So then the question becomes, how do you save all the people in the area? Well, you shove them through a portal. When an experiment into studying quantum uncertainty goes spectacularly wrong, physics student Bill Rustad and his friends find that they've accidentally created an interdimensional portal. They connect to Outland, an alternate Earth with identical geology, but where humans never evolved. The group races to establish control of the portal before the government, the military, or evildoers can take it away. 
the team has just hours to get as many people as possible to Outland before a lethal cloud of ash overwhelms them and kills over half of the Earth's population. This book never lets up. It has some amazing narration, with more than a few gasp moments and some laugh-out-loud moments that made it all a lot of fun. Dennis E. Taylor is becoming one of my favorite authors. This is the fifth book I've heard by him, which included the Bobverse series. We reviewed book one, We Are Legion, We Are Bob, a couple weeks back. So much fun, and Outland is just as good, and could even be a bit better. I highly recommend it. Now, if this appeals to you, head to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories, and you can have Outland for free. Here is what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook in 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out the service. This also grants you access to the included catalog, which is updated constantly with new stuff. So, to download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. You're not going to regret taking a look at this amazing service. Thank you, Audible. And now, let's hear a few of your amazing stories. These are your stories, sent by you, for you. Well, we have a loose theme for the podcast this week, and that would be the infamous volcano. Our story comes from just south of me in Devil's Garden, Oregon. Look at enough volcanoes and you'll find a bevy of names related to Diablo himself, probably due to the fires within. Devil's Garden is a lava flow field that stretches to the east of Newberry in central Oregon. This area is full of lava tube caves that might be as young as 10,000 to 20,000 years old. Many people have reported paranormal experiences while visiting the area especially at night. The most common story involves terrifying imp-like creatures that appear out of the shadows and chase visitors away. In one account, the creatures were described as looking similar to black dogs, except with long, skinny limbs, oversized heads, and no eyes. Many of these stories reported the loud, bone-chilling noises that the creatures made. Our story comes from Gustavo Klein, who happens to live in Newberry, Oregon. He sent in his tale, which he has titled, The Volcano Encounter. Hello, Ron. I have a story that most people I tell it to say that I made it up. I have no proof as to what I saw and experienced, except for the emotional scars that I carry. It happened in the area southeast of my hometown of Newberry, Oregon. It's a hard story for me to tell, and it's taken me a few years of listening to your show to bolster up enough courage to share it with you. But here I go. My friend Blaine and I decided to do some rock hounding in the lava fields. The area is rich with so many different types of rock formations that it is a finder's paradise. We began the trip with some good success, and before long, the whole day had slipped away. We were about five miles away from where we parked and realized that there was no way that we were going to get back to the car before dark. Not really a problem, but neither of us had thought to bring a lantern or a flashlight from the car. We had planned to explore some caves in the area, but we had never gotten around to it. The terrain in the area is rough, and the thought of walking through it at night was a scary thought. But if that was our only problem, I would have called it a win. As we chatted about what to do, the first screams echoed off the canyon walls. I can't really describe the yells. They were dog-like, 
yet had a human quality to them. They felt more like a warning than a call-and-response thing. Blaine said that they must be coyotes, and I agreed. But we both had heard coyotes before, and this wasn't it. To make matters worse, we were pretty sure that we were lost. In the dark, things looked totally different. Our one saving grace was Blaine's phone and the Compass app that he had installed. While not perfect, at least we were heading in the right direction. Going was really slow, and the strange sounds seemed to be getting closer. Also, they were now coming from all sides, which gave the impression that we were being surrounded. Not a good feeling. We kept trudging along, wishing that we had some torch of some kind. We looked for materials to make one, but quickly realized that even if we found some sticks and moss, we had no way to make fire. We stopped for a drink, and that's when I saw the shadows on the rocks ahead. They were smallest creatures, definitely not dog-shaped. If you've ever played D&D, you'd have to call them chasmies or impish. Chasmies are small bug-like things, creepy as heck and dangerous. Blaine saw them too and started to lose it. I calmed him down and we started moving again. I took over compass duties and periodically used the flash on the phone to help us through the rough spots. We'd gone about three miles according to the phone's GPS when a flight of small rocks came flying in and hit us from all directions. It didn't hurt us, but it sure scared the heck out of me. Then came the screech from behind us. I whirled around and shined the weak phone light at it. Standing there was a black silhouette of a creature, and it was holding some kind of weapon. We turned and ran hog-wild towards where we hoped the car was. The sounds around us intensified, and I felt my blood rushing through my body. I have felt fear in my life before, but this was borderline hysteria. They say the body and mind can do amazing things when subjected to the right stimulus. Because now I could see. I don't know how, but I could make out the ground, rocks, brush, and everything in clear detail. I grabbed Blaine's hand and quickly closed out those last two miles. Amazingly, there was the road and we followed it north. After what seemed like forever, we finally found the car. Funny thing was, is that the screams all went silent as soon as our feet touched the pavement. We got in, locked the doors, and drove home as fast as a 1998 Accord could go. I have nothing to prove that what we saw and heard actually happened. You'll just have to believe me that it did. I did some research and found that I was not the only one that had seen some strange stuff out there. Others had reported these dark creatures. The theory is, is that these beasts live in the lava tubes and are the product of the long-dead Devil's Garden Volcano. Gustavo Klein, Newberry, Oregon Wow, that is amazing, Gustavo. I've never heard anything about these creatures before your email. I too did some research and came across some creepy tales from that area. Devil's Garden is a strange, eerily beautiful hill that is actually a dead volcano that dates back thousands of years. Numerous creepy stories are centered around this dark cinder cone. Long ago, it is said to have been a place where witches met in secret. In the years since, visitors have reported many unusual experiences, like encountering hostile imp-like creatures in the dark of night. I think your story matches this and lends a lot of credence to what you've told us. Thank you for sharing this amazing story. This next story comes from Waikiki, Hawaii. It was sent in to the website using the Story Submission tab. Roxana Howerton is now 28 years old and lives in Los Angeles. She has titled her story, 
The Weird Boy in the Closet My family lived in a duplex until my brother graduated from high school and joined the Air Force. This would be just around the time when I started high school. My parents were getting fed up with our landlord. He was top-tier creepy, so they were looking to move away. They finally found a place they were satisfied with in an apartment building called Pearl One on Koakawa Loop. The apartment that was open was 22A, facing Waikiki Beach. I can't say that I was honestly creeped out by the place when I first laid eyes on it. I was distracted by the, whoa, 22nd floor awesomeness. Anyway, for the first few months, everything was fine, smooth sailing. Then the nightmares started. They were weird. I remember once dreaming of two boys playing in a junkyard when suddenly one of them goes berserk and begins stabbing the other with a rusted screwdriver. I can remember their faces and everything. Sometimes I dream about large cats attacking me. A nightmare I used to have as a kid returned. A volcano would erupt, covering everything in lava and killing everyone. Only I was left alive floating on my indestructible bed as molten hot skeletons were clawing at me, trying to drag me over. I noticed my nightmares intensified if my sliding door closet was opened. I never knew why, but I made the connections because whenever I'd wake up from these nightmares, I would be facing this open closet. I tried to keep that door closed as often as possible. I even put chairs in front of it to stop the dreams. In one of them, I had woken up and went to the closet, opened it, crawled on top of the blankets in there, and sat with my knees up in the darkness. I don't know how long I stayed there, but it felt like forever before I suddenly became aware of a presence beside me. I looked out of the corner of my eye to notice a little boy, perhaps eight to ten, sitting beside me. He was a scrawny, pale little guy with darkish hair. He had his knees up as well and his head buried in them, arms wrapped around to cover most of his face. I was curious. What was this kid doing in my closet? Was he hiding from something? That was the sense I got. So we sat, side by side, silently, until he finally stirred and looked up for some reason. The sight of his eyes scared me beyond all reason. They were gold, and his pupils were, for lack of better words, hourglass-shaped. They were like a goat's, and if it weren't for the indent in the middle, I'd say they were goat eyes. I couldn't get out of that closet fast enough, and I felt myself stirring awake. I could twitch my fingers and arms, and I was starting to open my eyes when I felt someone breathe into my ear and then laugh huskily. It was a deep male's laugh, throaty and breathy. I jolted awake after that, and I was scared out of my wits. In hindsight, this could have been just sleep paralysis. But there's one thing I can't explain. My closet door was open, and when I did wake up, I was still alone. Roxana Howerton, Los Angeles, California Well, that is a strange story. I have to wonder what you experienced. I did some research and found the apartment building that you lived in. Pearl One is a highly desirable location close to freeway access, airport, Pearl Harbor, public transportation, medical facilities, and within walking distance to shopping, dining, and entertainment. It is a solid building, with great amenities including clubhouse, pool, basketball court, barbecue areas, secured entry, and 24-hour security. Other than that, I couldn't find anything strange about it, except that I think I'd kind of like to live there. Thank you for your story, Roxana. I wish I could have found some answers for you. 
Well, that's it for this time. If you have a story that you'd like to share like Roxana did, head to the main website at ronsamazingstories.com. Click on the story submission banner, leave your story, give it a title, and please tell me where you're from. I'll read it if I can. Our featured story this week follows our semi-theme of explosive volcanoes. This time from the 1952 OTR series, Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle. The series aired on the mutual Don Lee West Coast Network and on CBS until 1953. Producer and director Joe Needy broached the idea of a Tarzan radio show to Edgar Rice Burroughs. Burroughs was excited and the show quickly became a family affair. Daughter Joan Burroughs would play Jane, and her husband and former movie Tarzan Jim Pierce would portray the Lord of the Jungle. Tarzan made his radio debut on September 10, 1932. Rather than being broadcast live like most radio programs of the time, the Tarzan show was pre-recorded onto phonograph records, which were then shipped off to the various radio stations. The show boasted state-of-the-art recording technology and elaborate sound effects. However, when the show premiered at the Fox Phages Theater in Hollywood, it was a live broadcast. 3,000 people attended the festivities, even Johnny Weissmiller himself showed up and listened as the first show was aired. Certainly one of the most unique live broadcasts of the era. What we'll hear today came many years later. The stories of Tarzan were told in three different radio series, two of which aired throughout the 30s and Lord of the Jungle in the 1950s. Our story is titled The Volcano of the Sun and first aired on March 6, 1952. Tarzan is accused of murder and must prove his innocence to the chief and his daughter. So please enjoy the famous Tarzan Yell. From the heart of the jungle comes a savage cry of victory. This is Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle. From the black core of dark Africa, land of enchantment, mystery, and violence, comes one of the most colorful figures of all time, transcribed from the immortal pen of Edgar Rice Burroughs, Tarzan, the bronzed white son of the jungle. And now, in the very words of Mr. Burroughs, the story of the Volcano of the Sun. At the base of a giant crater in the dense jungle of South Africa was the village of Lutoko. From stories of their ancestors, the villagers knew well what disaster could strike if they angered their god, the great volcano of the sun. Targo, chief of the Lutokos, had sent two villagers to offer a sacrifice of wild animal skins to the hungry monster. After three days had passed without the return of their brothers, fear found the hearts of all in the village. The chief, with his beautiful daughter Kala by his side, spoke to the frightened villagers. My people, we have waited three suns for the return of our brothers. The voice of the mountain grows louder each day. Hold back your fears and pray to the great god of the sun, for we must not anger him. If Kordo and Sama do not return, we shall know that it is the will of the great rumbling god. Look! There he comes! It is Kordo! What is it, Kala? My eyes are no longer young. It is Kordo, my father. He comes down path from Rumbling Mountain. And Sama, what of him? Kordo carries him. He does not move. I... Speak, Kordo. Say what has happened to Sama. He, he is dead. Oh, no. Who did this? My eyes did not see. Sama and I were parted in darkness of mountain. I heard him cry out. 
This is how I found him, his life running from a wound in his side. And now he has gone to long sleep. We must learn who did this evil. Sama tried to speak on mountain. Did you hear his words? He said, get Tarzan. Tarzan? He, the lord of the jungle. His words were false. Tarzan has been our friend. It is hard to understand. Many things are hard to understand. But this I know. The people of Litoko do not question the words of a dying man. Tell our people to prepare. Make jungle talk. We must find Tarzan. And the lord of the jungle will pay for his crime with death. We will continue with Tarzan in just a moment. As in civilization, bad news travels fast in the Congo. Tarzan, deep in his jungle home, heard the drums and knew their meaning. The lord of the jungle was wanted for murder. With Chimbo, his faithful chimpanzee, by his side... Tarzan prepared for a journey to the village of Latoko. But the drums were not the only warning. Ganji, a native friend of Tarzan's, had also heard the message and had rushed to meet the bronzed white sun. Ganji, what brings you here so far from your village? Great lord of jungle, you must flee. People of Latoko are hunt for you. They kill you. I know, I've heard the native drums. Then run. Do not let them find you. If you have killed native, as they say, I know it was for good reason. But Latoko people are angry. We'll not listen to you. I did not kill the native, Ganji. I have no idea why they suspect me. I I must go to Latoko and prove my innocence. I come long way to warn you, Tarzan. I have seen their anger, maddened faces. They will not believe you. You have long been my friend, Ganji. Yes, that is why I have come here. And you believe that I did not kill the native? Tarzan's word, always good. I believe you. Well, then you must know that I cannot let these people continue to think of me as a murderer. I must go to Latoko. But how can you convince them? They must think they have proof of your guilt. Whatever their proof is, I must learn the truth. Then there is nothing I can do to stop you. No, Ganji. I must face this alone and find the reason for the Latoko's anger with me. The jungle is my home, and I will never rest until I'm cleared. Then I wish you luck, Lord of Jungle. I will pray for your safety. Jimbo? Jimbo? Come, Jimbo. We go to Latoko. We must hurry. My father, come quickly. What is it, Kala? Tarzan, the lord of the jungle, walks into our village. Kordo, seize him. Bring him here, to my hut. Father, does this not mean something to you? Tarzan's crime is great. He comes to give himself up to the vengeance of the great god. Who would a guilty man walk into our village? The lord of the jungle could not be a murderer. You listen to your heart, pretty one. I know your feelings for the bronzed white sun. Chief Togo, here's Tarzan. So, Tarzan, you come to pay for your crime. I... I know nothing of this murder. Sama was my friend. I believe your words, Tarzan. Thank you, Kala. But I fear your father does not hear the truth of those words. Oh, father, you must listen to Tarzan. He has done many good things for our people. What he has done for the people of Letoko is in the past. Now he has killed one of your brothers. His punishment must be strong. Is there not some way I can make you see your mistake? Chief Tago, I I, I want to help you find Sama's killer. The Great Mountain has found the killer, Tarzan. The rumblings tell us. You believe that the volcano's action is caused by this murder? The mountain will be still when Sama's death is revenged. Father, you can't... Go, Kala. I will speak to Tarzan alone. But, Father... Obey me. Benda. Yes, Father. Kordo, bind Tarzan. Adio. Bind him tightly. The strength of the Lord of the Jungle is great. I offer no resistance, Chief Tago. I must convince you of my innocence. I I was many miles away at the time of Sama's death. You travel swiftly, Tarzan. I know your ways. 
And you know my ways do not include murder. Sama's death has ended our friendship. I go now to prepare Tarzan's punishment. Our god is angry. Tarzan must be sacrificed. Then the great mountain will be silent. Kudo will stand guard outside. Do not let Kala near Tarzan. Her heart will not let her head hear the truth. Adio, my chief. Kudo. Kudo, you were with Sama. Surely you do not believe I killed him, do you? I believe what I hear. Sama spoke your name. Then even you will not listen. I listen only to rumblings of mountain. They alone tell me what must be done. Alone in the hut, bound and helpless, the lord of the jungle waited silently for his doom. Outside stood Corrido, his trained eyes alert. No human could gain access to Tarzan's prison. No human, but... Chimbo! Standing on the ledge of the window, outlined by the moonlight, was Chimbo, chattering excitedly. And that Chimbo! Saidia! Alaga Watuli! Tarzan spoke to Chimbo in the strange language that he used with the beasts of the jungle. Perhaps Chimbo did not understand the words, but something, the tone perhaps, carried the idea that the Lord of the Jungle wished to convey. Chimbo hopped off the window ledge and disappeared into the darkness, only to return moments later with Tarzan's request, a rock. Chimbo moved obediently behind Tarzan. The Lord of the Jungle worked swiftly, scraping his bonds on the jagged edge of the rock. The heavy rope gave way under the relentless force. Seconds later, the bond snapped and Tarzan was free. Ah, good, good, Jimbo. Now we shall leave the way you came, by the window. Be silent. We go to the volcano. Perhaps there we will find the answer to this mystery. Tarzan's escape aroused the village of Latoko. The angry natives crowded around Kurdo, who could not answer their questions about Tarzan's seemingly magical disappearance. He is gone. How he left, I do not know. Surely the lord of the jungle is possessed of many mysteries. His innocence has freed him. His escape has angered our god. We must pursue Tarzan. Tracks lead to the great mountain, Chief Tago. Then we shall follow his tracks. Come, my people. Bring fire to light the way. The lord of the jungle will not escape the vengeance of the great mountain. On the face of the giant crater, high above the village of Latoko, Tarzan's jungle-bred senses quickly picked up a clue to the mystery of Sama's death. He smelled the scent of white men. The lord of the jungle followed the white man's spoor around to the opposite side of the treacherous crater. Then suddenly... Down, Jim! A tremendous explosion rocked the great mountain. Tarzan looked up to see a gaping crevice open in the side of the crater, blown out by the force of the explosion. Move quickly, Jimbo. We must find the white man. Before long, the whole mountain will spout forth death. Ahead of Tarzan, in a camp lit only by the light of a small fire, sat two men, Al Spencer and George Barton, silently eating the warmed contents of a tin can. Suddenly, and without a sound, the bronzed white son of the jungle was before them in the flickering light of the fire. Uh, Who who are you? I am called Tarzan. What do you want with us? I will ask the questions. What do the white men want on the sacred mountain of Latoko? We, uh, we're hunters. Yeah, yeah, hunters. I see no skins drying at the fire. You eat from cans, not as a hunter would do. Now look here. Whatever has brought you here, death will be your only reward on the mountain of Latoko this night. What do you mean? You'd do well to leave this mountain quickly. The volcano's given warning. What we do is our business. The jungle is my business, and what you do here concerns me. You will answer my questions. We'll answer nothing. What do you know of the murder of a native? Get out of here! Martin rushed at the Lord of the Jungle, lashing out with his fist. As the two men met in combat, Spencer jumped on Tarzan's back, only to be rushed aside like an annoying insect. Spencer crashed to the ground. Alone, Barton was no match for the powerful Tarzan. The Lord of the Jungle grasped the white man in a vice-like grip. 
Spencer, behind the fighting men, picked up a heavy hunting rifle. Slowly, he moved toward them. Then Spencer swung the rifle in a vicious arc. Carson went down in an unconscious heap. I, I got him. He, he would have killed me. He's as strong as a bull. Uh, this rifle's stronger. Cuts these big guys down to size. I've heard of him, Spencer, but I thought it was just jungle talk. He's some kind of a legend. Uh, he don't look like a legend lying there in the ground. But... What would he want with us? Uh, do you think he knows we killed that native? Uh, what could he know? Nobody could connect us with that. Suppose tarzan has got some kind of proof. Wouldn't do him any good. What do you mean? He won't be bothering anyone for a long time. But let's get out of here. Not if we get one more hull of diamonds out of that crater. Uh, are you crazy? You heard what he said. This whole mountain's going to blow its top. There's still a fortune in there. We're going to get it. Look. Look down there. That line of torches. The whole village is on the way up here. Now let's get in that crater. We'll make a fast haul and get out the other side. They'll never follow us inside. What about Towson? Leave him here. You heard what he said about killing that native. They think he did it. Now, come on, let's go. Those natives will make short work of him. If this mountain don't get him first... We will continue with Tarzan in just a moment. Struck down on the face of the volcano, Tarzan lay motionless as the angry villagers of Latoko drew nearer. Chief Tago and Kurdo led the procession in pursuit of the Lord of the Jungle. Kala, the chief's lovely daughter, struggled valiantly to keep pace with the aroused men. Look! It is Tarzan! He is hurt! He has been struck down by the great mountain to await his punishment. Look! Look! He moves. Uh, He looks, but he does not speak. Tarzan! Oh, Father, his eyes speak his innocence. Be silent, Kala. He shall be sacrificed to the volcano of the sun. Rise, Tarzan! (laughs) He no longer even protests his innocence. Perhaps the flames of the volcano will bring back his tongue. This time, the lord of the jungle will have no chance for escape. Oh, father! My people! Our village shall be saved from a mighty anger. Come, we go to the mouth of the hungry mountain. Spencer, Spencer, let's get out of here. We've got wealth enough to last us a lifetime. I want more. Keep digging. But the volcano, it's ready to blow. Shut up and dig. What? What was that? Sounded like a monkey. You're hearing things. I'm getting out of here. You couldn't find your way five feet without me. Now quit complaining and keep digging. I don't like it. No, but you'll like what these diamonds will buy once we get them out of here and back to civilization. If we get them out. What do you mean, if? I've come as close to death as I want to come. You'd feel the same if it'd been you, Tarzan, had a death grip on. Quit worrying about Tarzan. By now, those savages have killed him. What about this roaring volcano? The natives can't stop that from getting us. Uh, maybe you're right about that. Maybe nothing. Diamonds aren't going to do us any good if we're blown sky high. Okay. Grab this stuff and let's go. Come on, this way. Are you still silent, Tarzan? Though the boiling black lava below beckons? Oh, Father, I beg you. Our God commands us. Only Tarzan's death will appease his anger. Come forward, people of Latoko. Hurl the guilty one into the steaming depths below. What? What is this chimpanzee doing here? Chimbo. Enough of this. Wait. Wait. Look, look at the blue clay covering Jimbo. Can, can you not read its meaning? Blue clay means diamonds. And those shiny baubles have brought two white men to your sacred volcano. Though this be true, wait, I... Wait, wait, Chief Tago. The volcano is about to erupt. Only I can stop your god from spilling its molten death over your village. Only your death will save us. Wait! I will command the mountain to spread its destruction... In another direction. Believe him, Father. Perhaps Tarzan speaks truth. We must wait no longer. Tarzan must die. Great chief. Great chief. I... I will prove my innocence. Tarzan! Father! He runs into the sacred volcano! Stop him! His victory cry! Never again shall we hear it. He has entered the mouth of the mountain. Surely he has gone to his death. 
Inside the rumbling volcano, Tarzan ran with sure steps along the ledge of rock. Jimbo scampered in front of him, leading the Lord of the Jungle into the blackness. They reached the spot where Barton and Spencer had been digging. The white men were gone. They leave an easy trail, Chimpo. The strange companions raced together along the path left by the white men. Seconds later, Tarzan caught the glint of a rifle ahead on the narrow ledge. Easy. Easy, Chimbo. Yes, yes. They're just ahead. Who's there? You must pay for your crime, white men. It's Tarzan. Stay back, Tarzan. Come closer and I'll shoot. I do not fear your guns. Where is he? I can't see. A bullet will stop him. I, he, he's got a hold of me. One misstep and you're done. Shoot him, Barton. Shoot him. I can't see. Shoot, shoot. Ah! Ah! Spencer. He's gone to his death. Uh, uh, Tarzan. Uh, um, uh, give me that rifle. Uh, uh, now, you also will fall to the steaming earth below if you do not say who killed Sama. Martin, for the love of heaven, man, we've got to get out of here. Who killed Sama? The volcano, idiot. You will answer or die. Spencer, Spencer did it. The savage found us on the mountain. You will confess to the people of Latoko? Yes, yes, get out, get me out of here. Follow me. Outside, on the edge of the crater, the people of Latoko stood in frightened silence as they suddenly saw the Lord of the Jungle emerge from the blackness of the crater. And with him, a white man. The torches of the villagers cast an eerie glow as Tarzan dragged his captive to Chief Tago. Tarzan, who is this? Speak, white man. We killed him, my partner and I. We killed the native. Chief, the volcano... Your people must flee, Chief Tarzan. My shame is great for the wrong I have done you, Tarzan. Surely the great god of the sun will punish me. You must hurry. Take the white man and flee swiftly to the other side of the mountain. The mountain will cover our village with death. Your village will be safe. The lord of the jungle has promised you that. Hello, Tarzan! Kala? Where is Kala? She is not with me. I thought she The mouth of the mountain. She went after Tarzan. My daughter, we cannot leave her. Lead your people to safety, Chief Tago. I will return for Kala. (gasps) The the mountain shakes. You cannot go back in there. I must find Kala. Go! Go save your people. Kala! Kala! Kala, where are you? A violent explosion tore part of the ledge from under Tarzan's feet. His hand grasped quickly to the rocky wall. He clung precariously as he inched his way to solid footing. Kala! Here, Tarzan! Tarzan peered through the darkness and saw the frightened native girl. She stood on the ledge, her back pressed against the jagged rock. The rumblings of the volcano became more violent, threatening to shake her off the ledge to a boiling death below. Hold on, Kala! Tarzan reached the girl, grabbed her, and threw her over his powerful shoulders. The ledge behind them was gone. With Kala clinging to him, the lord of the jungle, hand over hand, scaled the inside rim of the crater and made his way to the top. On the face of the crater, Tarzan and Kala dashed in the direction of the village. The mountain seemed ablaze. Rocks fell around them. Tarzan pushed Kala to the ground and shielded her with his own body. Then, when the rocks stopped falling, they raced after Chief Tago and the villagers of Latoko. Look! The Lord of the Jungle has saved Kala! Quickly! Quickly to the village! All of you! You'll be safe there! Come, my people! We will trust Tarzan for this miracle! Where is the white man, Barton? Death fell on him from the mountain. The, the rocks? Yes. The volcano of the sun has had its vengeance. Tarzan and the natives turned to see the night sky filled with glowing death. Molten lava poured from the mountain, but its path was not toward the village of Latoko. The lava cascaded down the opposite side through the gigantic crevice. Oh, yes. The howling death goes away from our village. The lord of the jungle commanded. The volcano of the sun obeyed. Let us return to Latoko. (laughs) 
Peace has come once again to the village of Litoko, Tarzan. Can you forgive me for not knowing the truth? Chief Tago, when the reason is just, Tarzan forgives easily. <laughs> what of my feelings now, Father? Your heart, Kala, spoke the truth. But why did Sama utter the dying words, get Tarzan? Well, they were not meant the way they were taken. Perhaps he was crazy with fever and pain. No, no, no. Sama meant to get me to help, not for murder. He saved my life once long ago, and I had told him if he ever needed help to call upon me. His call was well answered, Lord of the Jungle. I must go now. I've been absent too long from my jungle home. <laughs> you see, Chimbo is also anxious to go. I will walk with Tarzan to the edge of the clearing. Goodbye, Chief Tago. Goodbye, Tarzan. Kala will miss you, Lord of the Jungle. And I will miss you too, Kala. Tarzan. Yes, pretty one? What magic did you use to make the great mountain spill its death away from our village? Oh, that was not my doing, Kala. But you said... I said only what I already knew. The volcano had split a crevice in the side of the mountain. The lava had to go that way, and your village was on the opposite side. Then you knew. <laughs> yes, pretty one. And now, farewell. Goodbye. Lord of the Jungle. Okay, that story was a bit cheesy, but I had some fun and I hope you did too. At the top, I mentioned Edgar Rice Burroughs. In case you don't know who he is, he was a writer best known for his adventure, science fiction, and fantasy stories. He created the characters Tarzan and John Carter of Mars. I've always loved the Carter series of stories and quite honestly could never figure out why there weren't more television and movies based on him. Tarzan sure got a run. Burroughs was born on September 1st, 1875 in Chicago the fourth son of Major George Tyler Burroughs, who was a Civil War veteran. Edgar himself was almost entirely English ancestry, but his family has been in the Americas since the colonial era. How about that? Tuesday deck, boom, boom, the foaming cleanser. Ajax cuts grease faster than any other leading cleanser. Do some pain, the elbow packs, when you start cleaning with Ajax. Ajax really polishes as it cleans. So use Ajax, the foaming cleanser. Bump the dirt, right down the drain. My gosh, they're right. Foaming action Ajax makes even the dirtiest pan shine like new in a jiffy. So use Ajax! That was episode number 588, and we had two epic stories today, sent in by Gustavo Klein and Roxana Howerton. My thanks to both of you, and your adventures. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button helps us grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.